This week, Stephen Hawking made worldwide news by saying there are no black holes. Now, I think that Dr. Hawking should be congratulated for his courage in saying that he was wrong. None of us like to say we were wrong. But the news stories have really been significantly off on this subject because they all say Stephen Hawking contradicts the predictions of Einstein's theory of relativity. But that's not really true. Seventy-five years ago, Dr. Einstein proved and published that his theory predicts that there can be no black holes. Now, I'm not talking about whether or not there are black holes. That really is a question for observation. I'll deal with it in a minute. I'm talking about the historical question, does Einstein's theory of relativity actually predict that there are black holes? The answer is clearly no. In October of 1939, Einstein published in the Annals of Mathematics a paper. The paper was about the Schwarzschild singularity. Now, this was before the term black hole was coined, and what they were talking about was the singularity that was in the equations, or the solution to Einstein's equations, developed by Dr. Schwarzschild. So Einstein asked the question, there arises the question whether it is possible to build up a field containing such singularities with the help of actual gravitating masses, or whether such regions do not exist in cases that have physical reality. So what Einstein was asking was, sure, somebody has come up with a solution to my general relativity equations that predict these strange objects, black hole, what we now call black holes. But he asked, do they really exist? Is there any way that nature could actually form them? Well, he does some calculations and he concludes, it follows that a particle is bound to follow a path with a radius greater than 2 plus the square root of 3, which is about 3.7 times greater than the radius of the Schwarzschild singularity. In other words, Einstein says and calculates that an object that's collapsing can't get so dense that it forms a black hole. And he explains in great detail with many equations why this is true, which is as the object gets smaller and smaller, it spins faster and faster, its particles move faster and faster, until its kinetic energy stops decreasing as it contracts. So it reaches a minimum energy condition and it doesn't contract any further. So at the end of the paper, as you can see, there are quite a few equations in it. He says, the Schwarzschild singularity does not appear for the reason that matter cannot be concentrated arbitrarily. So what Einstein said was, yeah, you can make a theoretical object that is so dense it becomes a black hole that even light can get out of it. But in reality, you can't produce such an object. Now, that same year, in fact, just a month earlier than this publication, another scientist whose name you know, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the man who led the Manhattan Project, published another paper on the same subject. Now that paper said that gravitational collapse could go to the point where a singularity would eventually come into existence. But Oppenheimer said, because of the distortions that are created by general relativity, the slowing down of time in a strong gravitational field, 
an external observer sees the star asymptotically shrinking, it takes an infinite amount of time for this mass or star to shrink to a black hole. Somewhat different conclusion than the, what Einstein came to because Oppenheimer forgot or didn't consider about the rotation of the object. But even here, he was talking about a black hole forming in the infinite future, never getting there, never quite getting there. Not about currently existing black hole that swallows everything up, light included. So, if back in 1939, these leading scientists, and I mean, no one was more expert on relativity than Einstein who invented it, said black holes can't exist in the real here and now. How did we get black holes being predicted by relativity? Well, we have to jump forward quite a number of years after Einstein's death into the 1960s when astronomers discovered quasars, these huge explosions happening deep in space. And it wasn't clear what their energy source was. And people hypothesized, well, maybe the energy came from the collapse of a giant gravitating body. And that can produce a ton of energy in a very small place. And there's no doubt that objects can gravitationally collapse. But what happened was interesting, was that a number of scientists, including uh, Kip Thorne, not only said, well, this is gravitational collapse, but they wrote a paper saying this would create a currently existing black hole, an object where at present light can't escape from. Oddly enough, they cited Einstein's paper without saying that Einstein's paper totally contradicted their point, which was strange and maybe not quite cricket. So these papers started to develop essentially a mythology that relativity predicted that these gravitational collapses had to end in the state of this mysterious black hole. This idea really caught on. Now, what started to happen was a real interaction between the scientists and journalists, science journalists. I mean, science journalists loved this idea. It was mysterious, it was fantastic, and it, you know, it had a certain resonance. I mean, why has black hole become a, you know, uh, a commonplace term? sort of resonates with some of the crazy things that go on in our own lives. I mean, if there aren't black holes, where do all those pins go? And if there aren't black holes, where did that $3 trillion the government gave the banks go? It sort of has a certain resonance. And it really sold newspapers and magazines. People liked this sort of crazy stuff. There was another more equally significant reason, which is the physicists involved basically were able to make news by simply writing equations, by simply saying this solution to these equations predicts this. We don't have to look out the window, we have, don't have to go to the telescope, we can just sit at our computers and write these equations, and then we get news headlines. So you've got this strange situation in which there never was any real observational evidence that black holes existed. Science is based on observing nature, not arguing over what nature should be. When scientists looked at quasars and other objects, they certainly saw gravitational contraction. But they never saw any evidence 
that these were black holes where everything disappeared into. In fact, some of these uh, objects that were very much like quasars but on a smaller scale, called Herbig Harrow objects, clearly were producing ordinary stars at the end of the, the gravitational contraction. So a star could be at the center of this gravitationally contracting object. Other scientists, including myself, pointed out that other forces, electrical and magnetic forces on a large scale, could produce some of these phenomena as well. So we come to the present day. Is Stephen Hawking the first present day scientist to say there are no black holes? Well, actually, no. I and many other scientists have been saying this for years. Just this year, uh, a paper with the title The Impossibility of Gravitational Collapse by Luganov and Mestrovich Shealy, who are scientists at the uh, Institute for High Energy Physics in Moscow, published a long paper which not only detailed why relativity does not predict black holes, and for, in fact forbids it, but also some of the history of the production of the mythology that I just outlined is stated in their paper. So what's the lesson to be drawn from all this? 75 years of no black holes, and yet 40 years of scientists you know, producing all of these papers about black holes. I think it says something about the problems that cosmology faces, because too many cosmologists are based purely in mathematics. I mean, you can ask, why could a theory like relativity, which we know has tremendous validity, produce mathematical solutions that don't exist in nature? That's really no mystery. Mathematics is a language that describes what we know about the universe. But just like in English we can describe things that are real, like the chair I'm sitting in, and we can describe things that are not real, like fairies, well, mathematics can equally well describe things that are real and not real. Those of you who remember back to high school or college physics might remember solving quadratic equations, equations that have, you know, x squared in them. Many times these equations, they describe a physical process, they'll have two roots, two solutions. One is positive, that's the real solution, that describes the physical universe, and one's negative. You just throw the other one away, it's not physical. So physicists have to do this all the time. Cosmologists have too often got away from this and simply said, whatever we write down reflects reality. Some years ago, a famous scientist, Hannes Alfang, who was the pioneer who developed the whole field of plasma physics, wrote that today cosmology is in the hands of scientists who had never visited a laboratory or looked through a telescope. And even if they had, it was below their dignity to get their hands dirty. They looked down on the experimental physicists and the observers, whose only job was to confirm their highbrow conclusions they had reached. And those who were not able to confirm them were thought to be incompetent. Observing astronomers came under heavy pressure from theoreticians. The result was the development of a cosmological establishment, like that of the Ptolemaic orthodoxy, which did not tolerate objections to dissent. So when we think about the saga of the late lamented black hole, we should also think about what other assumptions of cosmology are also incorrect, some of which I'll go into in a future vlog that illustrates some of what my book says about the Big Bang never happened. Thanks for listening.